concoct ourselves a little hangover cure that'll uh, induce her to spew red, white, and blue, then. <laughs> what about, like, milk and orange juice? What's the upchuck factor on that? Hi, hi, hi! Well, welcome to episode five. Wow, well, we are officially on the cusp of the main mythological characters. So if you recall last week, we talked about the first half of the succession myth, hence part one. But now it is time to tell part two. So in part one of the succession myth, that was pretty much standardized by our good old boy Hesiod, family troubles started brewing. Now, even though Hesiod's version told in Theogony is regarded as like the original and complete version, which is why it's considered the standard, this story was told lots of different times and by lots of different people as it passed down the generations of mankind. And a great deal of them weren't written down for hundreds and hundreds of years. So there are bits and pieces of this legend, as well as every other legend, that may be different or slightly off, but at the end of the day, they all still tell the same story. But enough backstory on the book, that's for next week. So as is the case, the happy union between Gaia and her son, Uranus, the personification of the sky, broke down as the offspring from apparently his very many nightly visits to his mother, started popping out of her. So Uranus hated his children, the Cyclops and the Hecatonchres. The Cyclops, of course, are the immortal one-eyed giants and the makers of lightning bolts, and the Hecatonchres were the hundred-handed and fifty-headed giants who had domain over stormy weather. They say hate, but the better word to use to describe his feelings were fear. The children were powerful and ugly, but still powerful, so he didn't want them out and about because he was afraid that they would overthrow him. Kind of messed up there, like pretty much manifesting his own personal takedown by overreacting. But anywho, so out of fear, he hid his children inside the earth, who is of course Gaia, their mother. But it is said that he hid them somewhere secret, but how do you not know where six of your kids are when they're back inside of you? But anyways, Gaia was not happy with the decision to punish the children in such a cruel way that she asked her other 12 kids to murder their father, the immortal personification of the sky. Bet you know how that went. 11 out of 12 kids did not want to step up to the plate and kill their father, the last one did though, the youngest actually. He took on the challenge and agreed to help his mother get revenge on his father to free his siblings. So Kronos then takes a sickle, which is a curved blade that is usually used for farm work, that was a gift from his mother and uses it to castrate his own father. This devastating blow to the sky deity had a bunch of repercussions except for the main goal it was meant to achieve. Following the slicing off, the genitals and the blood then fell from the sky and landed in the ocean and on the land. The genitals and the seawater created the goddess of love and beauty, Aphrodite, and the blood mixing with the earth created a bunch of creatures, like the furies, the giants, who were maybe actually giant but most of them were supposed to be just really strong the Oread nymphs of the mountain ash trees, and finally the Corites, the gods of the wild mountainside. But we'll get back to them shortly. After that was finished and Cronus washed his hands, you would assume the next thing on his list to do would be to free his siblings, which was like the whole purpose of mutilating his father. Uh, but no. Instead, he marries his sister and then claims command of the cosmos, then ushering in the Golden Age. But as he took the throne, his six siblings were still trapped in the same prison their now super humiliated father put them in. 
So he like viciously attacked one parent, let down the other, and failed his siblings. Now he has family issues of his own. So his parents told him a prophecy that would then lead us into the second half of the succession myth. Essentially, they told him that his kids are going to do to him what he has now done to his parents, aka dethrone and overthrow. But I'm just paraphrasing. And being drunk on power after holding the cosmos in his hands for like 10 minutes, he decides the best course of action is to just start eating his children, like whole and raw. Instead of maybe not having children, or maybe taking a more proactive approach to the situation, it could have been solved without the gross introduction of cannibalism. But no. The only logical way out of this problem was to eat the children. So pretty much to retain his power and keep it from his jealous and obviously dangerous babies, as soon as his sister wife would give birth to a child, Cronus would just gobble it up. It's kind of funny because, like, I know he's not a real person, so it's not really a burn on him, but he wanted to stay in power and keep control of the universe. So one would assume that he was quite vain and wanted to be pictured as this, like, mighty ruler of the cosmos and time while being king of the titans, aka his siblings. But most of the paintings of him and statues and any other art form that has his likeness depicted He's either A, castrating his dad, or B, eating his children. But there's not too much depicting him as the despot leader that he was, just a sociopath with a sickle and a sharp set of teeth. So even though he knew his kids were going to grow up to overthrow him, he took the chance and had like six of them. And these god babies were... Demeter, the goddess of the harvest, agriculture, fertility, and sacred law. Hestia, the goddess of the hearth, home, domesticity, virginity, family, and the state. Hera, goddess of marriage, women, childbirth, and also family. Hades, god of the dead and riches. And Poseidon, the god of the sea, storms, earthquakes, and horses. And I promise, these guys are all so interesting, so we'll go into more detail into all of them later on. But so one after one, Rhea would pop them out and he would pop them right back into his mouth and eat them. So after watching like five of her kids be eaten alive by her brother husband, she got a little fed up with giving birth to kids that she didn't even get to keep. The same way any wife would in this situation, she goes to her parents, Gaia and Uranus, also the disgraced parents of Cronus, and asks for their advice on how to solve this, like, kind of major marital problem. And, of course, wanting to see their grandchildren, and also really wanting to stick it to their stupid, terrible son, Cronus, they gave her an idea of how to get around this whole baby-eating situation. And the two of them gave their daughter an idea that sounds like, well, obviously this won't work. Like, how could anyone, even someone like Cronus, fall for this? So the plan was, the next time Rhea gives birth, to have it on the island of Crete, deep in a cave surrounded by her mother, Gaia, the Earth. After she gave birth to the baby, she gave him to the two nymphs, Adrastia and Ida, who were tasked with looking after the little baby, and then devilish little Rhea swapped out the baby to trick Cronus. And is she swapping out the baby for like a mortal baby? No, they don't exist yet. So is it like some other baby? Maybe like an animal baby? No. She swapped the baby out for a rock, a rock wrapped up in baby clothes. And Rhea then hands the rock baby to Cronus, and he eats it, thinking it's the last baby. And guess who the baby that Rhea swapped out for the rock was? Zeus, of course. Little baby Zeus. And actually, for a storyboarding project, in this one art class, we had to take a book that we already owned and choose a passage from it 
then turn it into a storyboard in our own style, but with a twist. I think I still actually have the storyboard somewhere. Maybe I do, maybe I don't. I'm actually not too sure. I'm gonna go look for it right now, actually. Okay, no, I don't have them. Or maybe I just don't know where I put them, but they are probably neatly tucked away somewhere at my parents' house. But I think I at least have a picture of baby Zeus. And if it's not obviously apparent through this crude rendering, my twist was that it was the 50s. So baby Zeus was baby James Dean. And I think Rhea was Marilyn Monroe. And I can't tell you who I made Cronus, but that was the theme. And I'm actually a little bit more surprised that there isn't more like modern content that puts the gods in like the 50s and 60s. Like I could definitely see a movie like the ones they have now where the gods are like 21st century gods and they wear pea coats like Percy Jackson, cough, cough. But I think that's something that hasn't truly been like explored yet. But what do I know? I don't know. Anyways, that was a little off topic there, whoopsies. So I think the place that we left off was baby Zeus was born. So Rhea gives birth to Zeus, right? And then following the advice of her primordial parents, she swaddled a rock like a baby and then gave it to dumb old Cronus to munch on. And he apparently ate the rock as if he doesn't know what a baby tastes like. Thinking he has now consumed all of his and Rhea's children, he is living his life worry-free. But little does he know, the children he actually brought into this life via the drops of blood from when he castrated his father were tasked with secretly hiding and raising baby Zeus until he was old enough. And old enough for what, you ask? Well, overthrowing his father, of course. The Corintes we talked about last week, who were the gods of the wild mountainside and the rustic arts, were in charge of guarding the cave that the two nymphs were raising little baby Zeus in. And they would dance and sing and clang their shields and spears together to make enough noise that Cronus could not hear the cries of the baby he was supposed to eat. Cronus, of course, did become a little suspicious, I guess, Took him a little longer than one would hope to realize he ate a rock and not an immortal baby. So he transformed himself into a snake and searched all over the island Rhea gave birth on, looking for a baby that might be out there roaming around totally not eaten. Not even a little bit. And even here, there's a few things that jump around depending on whose version you read. Because in one version, Gaia alone is actually the one who cares for baby Zeus and looks after him. In another version, Cronus doesn't even eat the babies. Instead, he just throws them into their later domains. Like he throws Poseidon into the sea and he drops baby Hades into the underworld. Which somehow feels meaner than eating them, but obviously it's not. Anyways, so the story continues on to say that under the care of the nymphs, the goats, and the crates, Zeus eventually reaches manhood, and he is now ready to take on his cruel father and restore his family. So Zeus, now fully grown, using his cunning, he manages to trick Cronus to consume some type of emetic which is defined as a medicine or other substance which is used to cause vomiting. Is that the Epicac bottle? Oh no. I remember, I think, reading a version one time where like he actually disguises himself as Cronus's cupbearer, but like who were the slaves and servants like at this time? Like there's only oh so many gods even born right now so like which poor lowly god had to serve like the more powerful beings i don't know it just sounds like it sucks for somebody but anyway so zeus at 18 years old i guess manhood right 
infiltrates his father's ranks and takes on the responsibility of handling his father's beverages, of course, totally unbeknownst to him. So after doing some undercover boss style work for a long enough time to gain the trust of his father and those around them, he acted upon his plan. Then Métis, who will also come up again later on in a weird way, but she is a Oshiet nymph and also the goddess of planning or wise counsel. But she gives Zeus a gross mixture and it's like something a kid would do. We'll just concoct ourselves a little hangover cure that'll uh, induce her to spew red, white, and blue, then. <laughs> what about, like, milk and orange juice? What's the upchuck factor on that? Yeah. I'm a no-rust build-up man myself. But it's a cup full of mustard, of all things, and wine. And, like, yeah, that's gross. But is it vomit gross? I personally wouldn't know because I actually don't like either of those things so i assume someone like me would maybe vomit because of it because i just don't like either of those two things but like if you liked wine and you like mustard would it necessarily make you puke if you happen to drink a glass of wine with mustard in it i don't know that's up for the scientists to figure out but cronus then drinks the mustard wine becomes immediately disgusted and then thank god barfs up all of zeus's older siblings but in reverse order so the baby rock comes up first then poseidon hades hera hestia and finally demeter i would assume because he ate like five babies whole and obviously never digested them so they were able to grow into full-blown adults would have had some kind of effect on his figure. Like, no way he was still, like, the ripped old man that he's shown in all the paintings at the time of, like, puking up all of these kids. You would think he'd weigh, like, almost a thousand pounds, right? But it's mystical mythology, so I guess in some godly way that wasn't the case. So after his youngest son causes him to regurgitate the rest of his children... Justice is then served again to a cruel father. And unlike the Titans, once he confronted his father, the three brothers, Zeus, Poseidon, and Hades, actually joined together and helped each other defeat the now weak and empty father. So once that was over, it was time to decide who would be the ruler of what. You might think, oh, okay, Greek myth, they probably did something horrific or unconscionable. But instead, like good old brothers, they decided to draw lots over who would have domain over what. Zeus drew best, so he became the ruler of the sky and king of the gods. I assume Poseidon pulled second best and was given control over the sea. And finally, Hades, having the least luck, but somehow still becoming a king, which is something that Poseidon was not given. But anyways, Hades becomes the king of the underworld and the god of the dead and riches, which actually doesn't sound that bad, right? And even though the story goes that Zeus pulled the best, maybe straws or pieces of paper, but more likely broken pottery, it's also understood that the draw just didn't matter. So this whole ordeal may seem a little confusing to someone who has like a more general knowledge of the gods. And to be fair, I was pretty deep into my fascination before I actually like understood this whole part of the story too. But so Zeus is like the king of the gods we all know and maybe somewhat love. Instead, he used to be a little helpless baby just like the rest of us. But he was running the risk of being eaten alive, so that's something that we don't have in common. After everything gets sorted out, Zeus places a stone at Delphi, which like becomes the site where all the cool oracles are located, to act as the sign for future generations of men, reminding them of what happened to act as a sign for future generations of men, reminding them of what just happened. And then doing the right thing, sort of, Zeus releases the Cyclops and the hundred-handed giants 
the Hecatonchres, from the motherly prison their father and brother left them trapped in. And to show gratitude to their nephew, the Cyclopses gave him a lightning bolt. Ta-da! So that's how he got it. And in another version, the Cyclopses actually give all of the big three their gifts. Zeus a lightning bolt, Poseidon his trident, and Hades his helmet of invisibility. Zeus is obviously the most powerful of the gods based on the acts he just performed to free his siblings, something that his father actually refused to do. But keep in mind, they're not actually Olympians yet. That is coming up shortly. And it's a whole nother can of worms. But like where we are right now, the Cyclopses and the Hecatonchres are free. Zeus is king of the gods and Cronus was kind of like waiting for everything to go down. But we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves here because some of this stuff actually doesn't happen until after this big giant war that they all have together. So like the dividing of the realms, it's something that actually comes in a little bit later, but it's just kind of like important to know like how they kind of sorted that out um, in regards to like after they were reborn kind of. But we'll talk all about that giant war later on. I think in like two weeks, actually, to be totally honest. Okay, well, that's a- another episode done. So let's get to the fun part. So for this week, the question to win the free Oh My Gods t-shirt is who was the first god to pop out of Cronus? So if you know the answer, you can head over to ohmygods.ca slash contest and submit your correct answer. And then if you get picked, you can get a free t-shirt. Now, next week, we'll be slightly veering off course, but this will be the second media episode. But like I promised during the Troy episode, this one would be about a book. I think I'm going to do like a ping pong thing with these episodes, one month a movie and the next month a book, and then carry on like that. But I bet you can guess which piece of work we'll be going over. It's ancient, it's long, and we've been talking about it for like a month. Yes, that's right. It's the actual poem Theogony by Hesiod. We'll dig a little bit more into the parts we skipped over, like the whole preface, which is very interesting, and sort of go line by line through the various modern translations, and of course talk about our main man himself, but it will be fun, and I promise you'll love it. So if you like what you heard, please feel free to follow, subscribe, rate, and all the rest. And if you're looking for info or deets, check out ohmygods.ca for the reading slash watching list, as well as the cheat sheet and the upcoming episodes. Thanks again for listening. Okay, bye.